morning, I have been laden with the responsibility of finishing up um, the third message of our relationship series that we were talking about last week on the subject of parenting, on the subject of parenting. If you haven't been here for this relationship series, I'm going to give some outliers that you need to know. In the very first week, we talked about how we treat one another, brotherly, sisterly, friendship, relationships. And uh, in the second week, then we talked about um, healthy marriages through one specific area that we talked about more in depth this weekend, healthy communication, healthy communication. And then last week, we started talking about parenting, but we, we, we got a little late in the hour, and I said, you know what, I'm only going to do two, and I'll save the following two for the, for the next week this Sunday. So we're going to go back to the parenting relationship this morning, but as promised, there are a couple other messages in this series, and I'm just not ready to turn the page on them yet, just because the month is changing. So um, hopefully you'll be okay with that, but in the next couple of weeks, we're going to stay here in this relationship series and keep trudging through this a little bit more. But before we do that or go any further today, there's a couple of other things that, that I want to announce. Number one, if you're a man and you're in this room and you have not signed up um, for men's advance this year, I would greatly encourage you to go out. Um, to the gathering area and sign up. The cost is minimalistic. It's a district event. We have two of our pastoral staff speaking there this year. Pastor Mike will be speaking and Pastor John O'Gates, which is a huge honor for us. The following year, I believe I'm the speaker at Men's Advance, and so we want you guys to go and be a part of this with us. Um, if you have your Bibles today, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, and as you're turning there, I have some good news for you. Has anybody noticed lately that the snow is melting woo, 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 woo. I was eating lunch with someone the other day and uh, and the wife said oh I hate to see it go and the husband said not me <laughs> the temperatures are warming up the snow is melting now I don't know if it's just a false hope but I'm enjoying it while it's here I saw a couple of blades of grass in my yard the other day I said oh how I have missed you I was ready to get my weed eater out <laughs> Um, but as the temperatures are warming up, and as I reported last week directly from people that know, I may not personally know, but from doctors uh, and people affiliated with the church at the clinic, the COVID cases are down at the clinic. The COVID case cases are down for this area. Come on, how many of you know that's a good thing? Restrictions seem to be loosing. You say, well, I haven't seen it here in Minnesota yet, but they are. Let me tell you this. I found out this morning four different states are removing their mask mandate. The two states southern below us, both Iowa and Missouri, are move, removing their mask mandate. Come on, hallelujah. Texas is removing its mask mandate, and there was a fourth state. So we are trending and moving the right direction. Now, I'm not saying all of that to get political arguments started. I'm just telling you that's the right direction because I don't enjoy believe it, breathing carbon monoxide all the time. Monoxide or dioxide? Dioxide, yeah. I don't, I don't enjoy breathing my own hot breath. And, and it's hard. Pastor Mike has to walk around with a mask that says, I am actually smiling under here because I can't see people's faces under it all the time. And in light of that, many people, you thought I was just talking about COVID. In light of that, look around the room. More people are showing back up to church, man. More people are showing. And that is a good thing because church is essential. Church is essential. You say, oh, you're supposed to say that. You're the preacher. You're right. I am. But let me tell you something. I am also a Christian. And I can tell you that gathering together with my brothers and sisters is essential you say, how do you know that? Because I lived months of my life in solitary confinement. Trust me, ask my friend uh, in this room that I won't call his name, but living alone for a long time is not a good thing. You need other people in your life. You need other Christians in your life. We need it. It's essential to our growth. And as the church is reopening, as the temperatures are changing, as the restrictions are loosening around the country, Easter is coming. Somebody say, among the living. He is among the living. He's not dead. He's not in a borrowed tomb. He is alive. And because he's alive, we get to be alive now. We get to be alive for eternity. And we are starting to plan this week for Easter. So I want you to get busy, get active, inviting people. We're going to probably just do church services all weekend long, maybe like at least Friday and Sunday, maybe Friday, Saturday, Sunday, maybe Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We don't even know, but if the 250 is still in place, 
We're going to just have church all weekend long to celebrate Easter so you and your families can safely and securely come. So that's coming. Easter's coming, and we want you to get excited about it. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6 was our scripture from last week, and it literally says this. Train up a child in the way that he or she should go, and when he or she is old, he or she will not depart from it. Read that one more time plainly. Train up a child in the way that he should go, she should go, when he or she is old, he or she will not depart from it. Father, today I bow my head before you, the God of heaven, and I ask that you would help me, as you already have one time, help me again to communicate um, beyond my ability. God, help me to communicate these truths in a way that would be rich, informative, but more importantly, transformational to the hearts and the lives of the people here today. If you would agree with that, come on, somebody say amen, and amen, and amen. You know, I understand there's some younger people in this room today, and, and Constance, I'm just going to use you because I know your mom and dad, and at least they won't write me an email. They would just tell me, please don't use my daughter again. But, but Constance, you, you, you may not realize it, sweetie, but some of the things you're growing up hearing, some of the things you're growing up seeing with your mom, growing up seeing with your dad, I, I'm, not, I'm not prophesying. I, I don't know every day, every hour, every page of your future. God does. But I can assure you as you walk along the journey of life, the road of life, some of those things that you didn't think were in there from your dad, from your mom, you're going to wake up one day 32 years old and you're going to say, how in the world did I become my mom? How did I become my dad? That's essentially, was that, is that okay? That's essentially what the scripture is saying. That we as parents, yeah, we focus in this Western world on leaving inheritance, in which that's important. You know, Brooke got up here at the marriage conference, we were talking about money and told them, you can't take it with you, spend it now, don't leave it to your kids. <laughs> Just kidding. She said something close to that. I was like, yes, I'm going to remind you of that Tuesday. <laughs> You know how sharp she's got now, Pastor Mike? I'm like, Brooke, can we? And she's like, pray about it. That's what she tells me. I'm like, Brooke, can we do this? She's like, just pray about it. I'm like, I need a yes or a no. Pray about it. I think she knows God wins more than she does. <laughs> God than her, than me. And so the scripture is literally saying that, 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 that the things we pass down to our children, even if they run from it, or even if they stay with it, at some point in life, it's going to be a, a GPS, a God. It's going to be a honing system that brings them back to some degree into alignment with the things of God that was in them. Has anybody ever raised like, like in the faith, around the church, around Christian parents, and then you tried to go out there and do your thing for a while? And then, like, everybody else seemed to be having fun. Everybody else, ah, ah, ah. they're at the club, they're drinking and partying and having fun or whatever they're doing. And, and they're enjoying it, but you're not. You're like, I want to enjoy it, but I can't. It's just, that's just what the Scripture is saying to us, that, that this thing that gets inside of us, it's not the inheritance we pass down. It's the spiritual heritage that we pass down, where our children see us pray, they see us give, they see us witness, they see us worship, they see us struggle, they see us trust God for miracles, and that, that thing gets inside of them, and then even if they try to run from it, it's a heritage inside of them that they can never get away from. I talked last week about when we're raising our children, how our children are like dry, a, a blank screen. And it's our responsibility, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a different dimension today. It's our responsibility what goes on that screen. Now, there's some things inadvertently from the world or indirectly are going to get on that screen. But for the most part, in their adolescence, formational years, it's our responsibility what goes on that screen. There are some things, I don't want to get political right now, but there are some things that the world is advocating that are okay that need to be imprinted on children that I'll just be honest with you I'm not okay as a parent being imprinted on my child and if that means I have to homeschool them if that means I have to raise them I'm not trying to keep them in my bubble I'm, I'm not trying to protect them. I want them to know more I want to talk to them about the things that I, that are important in life sex and money and relationships and and gender and family and marriage and future I want I'm not gonna let somebody else talk to them about that I'm gonna talk to them about we are gonna talk to them about that 
I don't, I don't need someone else teaching my kids that. I want to teach my, because they're my, not only are they my blessing, they're my responsibility. They're not the public school system responsibility. They're my responsibility. Amen? That's essentially what this verse is saying. But last week, when, when I began to talk to us about the relationship of parenting, I, I made an image. Maybe you've seen it on, on um, social media somewhere. Whoever took that picture did a great job. Our media team, kudos to them, about, about children. Actually, in the Bible, Psalm 127, verse 4, says that children are like arrows in our hands. They're like arrows in our hands. And I mentioned a few points about arrows. I actually brought some arrows up here last week and, and, and made four simple points. I said that every year when, when hunting season ends here in Minnesota, when it gets you know too snowy, too frozen outside to go hunt, it's important that I store them right. And I compared storing our children right to our home lives, our home lives. That was the first point from last week. Parents, we must be on the same page. If we're going to... to, to handle our responsibility if we're going to parent well if we're going to handle our responsibility of these arrows in our hands that we we have to look at how we're storing them we have to look at their home lives and one thing that's critically important about our home lives at least according to the prophet Amos throw that back up on the screen Amos 3 and 3 simply says this can two walk together unless you both agree the answer to that is obviously no mom and dad have to be on the same page about many things in life we shared many of those things for free this weekend at the relationship conference but you have to to store those kids right and it starts with mom and dad being on the same page another illustration that I made last week was about keeping them straight I, I, I own this um, this big bow case this Matthews bow case did everybody hear me Matthews bow case Matthew's bow case. Don't ask me. I'll give you a thousand reasons why you need a Matthew's bow. Matthew's bow case. When I was, I don't care about all the other ones. I know the people of Matthew's bows. Dr. Tim Wiltshire knows them. They're fabulous people. They're Christian people. They're godly people. They love the Lord. Matthew's bows all day, baby. I'm not talking about no other bow. Matthew's bows. But I own this big Matthew's bow case, and when I and when I close this bow case, there's these little ridges, these veins in there for how your arrows are stored. The reason those ridges and veins are in there is because when you close your bow case, you want to make sure that those arrows are stored straight. You don't want them in a bind. You don't want them crooked. You don't want them twisted. You don't want them, you don't want them, you know, kind of under tension, torqued and turned the right way. And we liken that principle of keeping them straight to this concept of maintenance. Maintenance. Here's a maintenance principle for us parents. I shared it last week. Point number two. Parents must develop a passionate relationship with God first you say well how does that have anything to do with maintenance well here's the maintenance you are incapable of passing down to your children what you first do not possess the best maintenance that I can give you for your children is to get passionate about God in your personal life first and that passion from you will be passed down not as an inheritance but a heritage to your children and trust me God can do more with your kids than you can you can't be with them every day, every time, and every place. Oh, buddy, but as Pastor Mike would say, the hound of heaven can. God will be with them, inside of them, in every fork in the road and help guide them into the life that he has for them. Has anybody ever experienced the hound of heaven? I like that old Jesus culture song that says, he won't relent until he has it all. He won't relent until... He Man, you can try to run from God. You can try to keep some things back from God. You can try to do halfway with God. And he just will keep on and keep on and keep on and keep on until he has all of your heart. Till he has all of your life. Till he has all of your belief. Till he has all of your family. Till he has all of your money. For some people, let me make this, let me make this attainable. For some people, that's like, okay, I've tried everything else. I'm ready to give it all up and I want God. And it's real instantaneous. For some people, it's like a slow process. It's, you know, one week, one month, one year. And no matter which one of those persons you are, what does matter is that you're in the relationship with God. And I can tell you how the chapter ends. He gets it all in the end. He wins. He doesn't stop till he has all of you. But that's the most important thing that you can give down to your children. It's the best maintenance system I know to teach you. But there were two more illustrations from the arrows I wanted to talk about last week about keeping them sharp. Has, has, has anybody in this room ever lived out this principle in life that it's almost better to just, just 
pick up as you go at home versus letting the whole house get wrecked and then taking six hours to clean it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a let's just pick up as we go guy. And, and Brooke is as well, so that works well. Can two walk together unless they both agree? No. But I can tell you, if you wait till your kids have dull edges, if you wait till your kids have broken points, if you wait till their blades have been bent over, and then you try to go in and try to, try to reforge blades or try to re-bend the blades or try to sharpen the blades, it's just better to just maintain it's just better to keep them sharp all the time just with a daily conversation just at the dinner table just as a text message just it's just better to do it routinely than it is to let them end up in the jail cell to end up in 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 bad situations and some people say well i've done all that i was doing all that and he still got in the jail cell well then you got to go back to proverbs 22 and 6 god's inside of him you pass down the heritage and even if he acts like a dummy for a while god will bring him back in the end You know, it, it, you can't be God, so don't bear that responsibility. You did what you were supposed to do as a parent, but at some point it has to be, now I've done all I can do. I have to trust God's sovereign ability. Some of us have been that son. But on this topic of keeping them sharp, I want to share with you an area of how we can train and teach our children. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3 say this, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Check this out. For children to obey your parents in the Lord. That's where I focus as a parent. I'm like, you're supposed to be obeying me because this is what the Bible says and the Bible says it's right. But check this out. What we're negating there is the implied principle that children are only obeying because we're first instructing. Mm. See, we get focused on the you obey, but what's implied there is they're obeying because you've taken the time to teach and train and instruct. You can't forego that sharpening process and expect them to be sharp in life when you didn't sharpen them. You have to train them. You have to teach them. Check this out. Verse 2. Here's some more instructions. Honor your father and your mother, which is the very first commandment in the whole Bible, Exodus chapter 20, that also has a promise attached to it. Do you want to know what that promise is for children? If you will obey your mother and father, it will go well with you and you will live long in the land. There was a commandment given for children to obey, and then there was a promise attached to it that it'll go well with you and you'll live long in the land. Let me show you the literal fulfillment of that and the spiritual application of that. The literal fulfillment of that was because in the law of Moses, if a child disrespected their parents, they were to be drug out in public, in the public square, and stoned. It would not go well with you, nor would you live long in the land if you disobeyed your mom and dad. Praise God I didn't grow up under the law. I would have been dead at two. <laughs> right? And guess what? So would you. So would you. Now, the spiritual principle of that, check this out. It will go well with you and you will live long in the land spiritually if you listen to your parents. If you listen to your parents who actually had a relationship with God and they were ongoing in their maintenance of you, in their teaching of you, in their sharpening of you, and in their training you all the days of their lives, then if they were doing that, it'll go well with you because you would have known that you didn't need to be drinking on a Friday night and get a DWI where you ruined your life and your career because your parents would have taught you that it would have gone well with you and you would have lived long in the land you would have been taught those things from your parents from God that he would have given them to give you and you would have known sharing sexual partners was not the thing God wanted you to do and how you contracted an STD that robbed you of your life early in life is that too serious for you this morning you would have learned from your parents what God instructed men and women to do in the earth and how God would have blessed that and you would have heard that from your parents and then been able to live that out in life now but here's the other side of that if you didn't grow up hearing those things you may not have known those things and your life probably doesn't start going the right direction you know why that is is because we as men think we make the rules to the monopoly game and we don't my friend we are born we live in this earth the game rules have already been set they were created by almighty God and he said these are the rules you live this way you walk this way you talk this way and if you do it and if your mom and daddy taught you to do what I said to do it will go well with you and you'll live a long prosperous life but if you don't it's not going to go well with you and your life's going to be snuffed out early with sin death and sickness seems harsh but that's how it goes my friend you can't live this alternative life and say, oh, God bless this. There's consequences for living alternatively. God only blesses what he's ordained because he's just, and God ordained how men should live. 
how we should worship, how we should eat, how we should act, how we should behave. And what the parents are supposed to be doing is teaching that to their children. Now, children, you don't have to worry about somebody dragging you out to the street and stoning you. But what you can rely on is that promises that if you had parents that raised you in the things of God, your life's going to go well and you're going to live long in the land. Because the guy that made the rules of the game has already commanded his blessing on that order. You say, well, what if I grew up wrong? What if I didn't do that? There's never, if you're breathing... It's never too late to start making good decisions. If you're alive and you got breath in you, it's never too late to get back in line. It's never too late to say, today is the day I'm ready to get in line now. <clears throat> Here's what the Bible says to children. Obey and honor. It will go well with you. You'll live long in the land. But the flip side of that where I really wanted to get today is this. Parents must realize that what God has actually given us besides the blessing of our children is we are on a rescue mission to train them to live and walk and talk the right way in the earth. We not only have the blessing of our children, but we have the responsibility of raising them right. Do you know how we're raising them? We're raising them to be under God's umbrella, Ella, Ella of authority. <laughs> Anybody remember the old Rihanna song, Umbrella, Ella, Ella? You can't live outside and out from under God's umbrella, Ella, Ella, and say, oh, God, bless me. But once you get under God's umbrella, Ella, Ella, that your parents pass down to you, you can expect God's blessings on your life. Yeah, they're a blessing. Yeah, they're like arrows. But it's your responsibility as a parent to train them, to teach them, keep them little suckers sharp. Keep them sharp. Don't wait till they break a blade. They're going to break some, but don't wait till then to start telling them about Jesus, about redemption, about prayer, about the Holy Spirit, about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, about miracles, about witnessing, about giving, about humility, about honor. Let them hear that coming from you. Let them see that in your lifestyles. Let them see that in your marriage. Check this out. Too many today have left training their children to others. Here's who we leave training our children to. The government, to the media, and to the culture of the day. However, this is a sacred responsibility that God's given us as parents. To not only enjoy the blessing of our children, but to be saddled with the responsibility of training our children. Anybody ever been around somebody's kid and say, I know they don't get no home training. <laughs> <laughs> you ever been around somebody's kid? You say, oh, I could lend them a little home training right now. <laughs> I'm going to leave it alone. <clears throat> Parents must bless their children. Last point that I wanted to make this morning, the last illustration is we have to launch our children in the right direction. Launching our children in the right direction could be compared to giving them guidance. Many parents don't, don't, don't realize this, but we curse our children with the very words of our mouth. We, we snub them, we pigeonhole them, we undercut them, we undermine them, we, we strip them of ability, not by like literally swearing at them, but like the things we say over them that cut them and demean them. And if you don't realize this, parents, I'm just telling you, your words carry power as a human being because you were created in the image of God and God spoke to create all things and your words carry power as well. But I'm going to tell you, your words carry more power in the life of your children than many of us realize. You can say things over your kids that hinder your kids all the days of their lives. Or better yet, you cannot say things over your kids that hinder them all the days of their lives. Let me show you this. Genesis chapter 27, verse 34. When Esau heard the words of his father Isaac, he cried out with an exceeding great and a bitter cry, and he began to disclaim or claim to his father, say to his father, bless me also, O my father. Do you know why Esau was crying out for a blessing? Because he had just heard Isaac bless Jacob. And you don't realize it, but maybe you've got a kid or maybe you've got a daughter or maybe somebody and you say positive, encouraging things, blessing things over those kids and your kids have a heart cry inside of them saying, say that over me. And you say, well, I'm not saying that over you because you don't act that way. If you wait for them to act that way to say that, they may never get there. But if you start saying that over them, it will help them act that way. Let me show you the principle. 
You think God waited for you to get good to call you good? Or God look at you bad and call you good? You think God waited for you to get good in order to make you righteous? Or did God look at you as unrighteous and then call you righteous? And now all of a sudden through this process of life, you start taking on the demeanor of righteousness. No, our God calls those things that are not as though they already were prophetically and by faith. We have to be able to say that over our children. Listen to, the, the, listen to me. The necessity of bestowing a blessing over our children today is frequently overlooked. There are many children today who are desperately pleading for their, ch- their parents to say something positive over them. When mothers and fathers brought the children to Jesus, the disciples rebuked him and said, keep these kids away from him. He's too busy. He don't have time. But Jesus rebuked his disciples and encouraged to let the little children come. Jesus took time for these children. He held them in his lap. He touched them physically. And he spoke with a tempered tongue tenderly to them while he was speaking roughly to the devout religious men of the day. I'm showing you that Jesus' demeanor of how he treated children was different than how he treated grown men. Do you treat your children? Like they are grown-ups? Do you treat your children like they work for you? Do you treat your children like you would treat the guy at the mechanic shop? Look at this. To bless your children is to speak a message that attaches a high level of value over them. It's to speak a message that creates a picture inside of them for the future that activates that dream inside of them by the very comments that you say over them to help them fulfill that destiny in their lives. You know why my kids don't have the name John or Sam or Tim, and I'm not knocking John or Sam? Because I believe names are very important. Have you ever heard somebody preach his name was Abraham, and it means father of many nations, and wonder why his name meant the very thing he lived out to do is because God understood the importance of names. And what we say over people repetitiously matters. You're never going to be anything. You're no good. You're a dimwit. You're nobody. Somebody said to me the other day, first time I think it was Pastor Ernie Gafkin, first time he ever said, heard his dad say I loved him was the day he signed up for the military. Well, I'm sure it made him proud in that day, but how many days earlier in life had that dad missed it telling his son he loved him and he was proud of him? It doesn't mean it's going to keep them from getting in trouble. It means they're going to know their self-worth. And listen to me, if your boys and girls don't know who they are and what they are and what they believe in life, there's a big world out there waiting to tell them something contrary than what you're wanting them believing. You don't know this, probably, but I'm going to share something with you. If there was ever a man that walked the planet that didn't need to be blessed or affirmed, it was the man Jesus, right? Because he's God Almighty in the flesh. But check this out. Two times in Jesus' life do we see his dad sitting in the top bleachers like a crazed lunatic dad at a little league peewee game. That's my boy! When the day Jesus was baptized, the heavens part, and all of a sudden a thunderous voice says, This is my beloved son. In whom I am, it was his dad patting him on the back saying, you're my son, boy. Jesus goes up in Luke 16, the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses shows up. That's the lawgiver testifying he's the Christ. Elijah shows up testifying as the chief prophet he's the Christ. But it didn't matter what men said about Jesus until the heavens parted. And the father's voice was heard again patting his son on the back saying, this is my son. Listen to him. Yeah, Jesus didn't need affirmation, but we've seen God stop heaven and earth twice to affirm his son. How much more do our natural children need our affirmation this afternoon when we walk out of this place? That's how you shoot them in the right direction. Say, woo, preacher, this relationship series is getting tough. Here about, how about this? How about this? Take out your Bibles right now. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Maybe they'll put this on the screens. I don't know. I didn't tell them earlier. Forgive me. Isaiah 53 in the New King James translation, beginning at the third verse, says this. He is despised and rejected by men, he being Jesus. He was a man of sorrows, and he was well acquainted with grief. And we, humanity, we hid our faces, as it were, from him. 
And we just despised him and we did not esteem him. We treated Jesus, humanity did when he came, with contempt. But surely during his lifetime, it was our griefs that he was carrying and bearing. It was our sorrows that he was enduring. Yet we esteemed him as just stricken, stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. So here's what the, what the prophet is saying. The prophet's saying, when this guy Jesus came, check this out. He was a man acquainted with grief. He was a man acquainted with sorrows. We did not as humanity esteem him as anything special. We just thought that he was being smitten and stricken by God. He was being afflicted by God. But little did we know in verse 5, check this out. He was actually overcoming and going through all of that enduring it for our wounds he was doing it for our transgressions he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the sin and iniquity that we would commit check this out and the chastisement of our peace what it would take to be at peace with God the punishment he carried upon his own body and check this out and through his sacrificial death we are healed we are healed does anyone know how many years Isaiah lived and prophesied before the lifetime of Christ seven with two zeros 700 years before Jesus was ever born Isaiah looked through the corridors of time and he saw a man come that humanity would disregard and he saw a man carry our griefs carry our sorrows be beaten be afflicted the chastisement of our peace with God would be upon him and that through his sacrificial death we all could be healed you say pastor show me the correlation I just preached to you about our sacred solemn duty as parents and many of us in this room feel overwhelmed we feel heavy laden we feel insignificant we feel like there's no way in the world we can do it or we haven't done it rightly but what I'm sharing with you now out of Isaiah is there was a guy sent from heaven who was the son of almighty God to make up the gap to make up the difference you can only do what you can do you can't get back the bad decisions of yesterday you can make right decisions today and you can try hard tomorrow but no one in this room needs to walk out of here feeling like a failure nobody needs to walk out of here feeling like you're insignificant and like your life doesn't matter and this story is so steep and so tall you can't do it because God sent his son to make up the gap not only between you and God but between you and your children and God between you and your grandchildren and God and check this out and it says by this by this sacrifice we are healed anybody feel broken today you feel broken right anybody feel helpless today anybody feel feel uh, uh, incapable today that's the word I'm looking for or does anybody feel healed today? Anybody feel victorious today? Anybody feel, it just, I know you feel that way. It's just because you're looking at it from the wrong viewpoint. You're looking at it from the natural. You're looking at it from the circumstances. What you got to do is back up and start looking at it through the cross. You got to back up to God's point of view and start looking at it the way God looks at it. You see, this prophet also goes on to say that even though your sins be like scarlet, even though your sins be like crimson, through his blood, he can wash them white like snow. He can wash them white like wool. Even when you didn't say the right thing, even when you didn't do the right thing, even when you didn't give the right effort, God can make up the gap. God can bring healing. God can bring wholeness. God can restore. God can reheal. God can revive. God can resurrect. That's what he does. 